my me also. So um, if I show you things, it'll you'll be able to see it, right? Okay. Uh, since uh, February, I started when I moved here. I started uh, drawing at the dining table on a lap board, like so. Uh, I don't know. I, I actually can't see myself very well, but. Yeah, one of these large lap boards with like a clipboard at the top, uh, and I thought I would—I thought that would be bad at first because uh, it can move. So you're, you know, you're putting your your a little bit of weight on it, your hands on it. Um, you're trying to draw, and what if like if you shift your weight at all, it's gonna move. It's it's leaning on the table, but it it's not static like a drawing table is. But it actually hasn't bothered me at all, uh, and I think it actually like helped me loosen up a bit because it feels like i don't know like it the, it moves but it moves with you the lap board's kind of in your hip joint there and like if you if you move it's moving so uh it, it i think it made me loosen up a little bit um i probably am encouraged to put less weight on the table too with my forearm um which i think helped me loosen up so i, I it's actually been good i think uh, when i switched to doing that um so I don't have like a dedicated uh, office anymore. I just draw at the draw at the dining table, but uh, that hasn't bothered me really either. Um, I keep I keep my art stuff close to there, uh, like in some drawers in the in a buffet and stuff, so I can I can get it out uh, anytime I want and just sit down and and draw. Um, and then this computer I'm on now, this is where I do the coloring. Uh, and and lettering and the rest is at that at that uh, dining table. Uh, the musical mishaps of Cat and Fiddle is the project I've been working on for quite a while. Uh, so I, I finished the first six issues and then started this this uh, this new series uh, of issues last sometime last year. I don't even remember. Um, but I was I, well. I started writing it last year. I, I may not have started even drawing until this year. Matter of fact, I can probably look at the first page's date here because I have all my pages here. Okay, so I started in December at the end of December. So yeah, like right in January, I started drawing. Uh, it's been a slower year because I started uh, working a job and had a college class and things like that. Uh, so it's been slower for me. But I'm on page fifty-seven. Uh, of the first issue, uh, so that, that that's the pace at which I've been able to complete it this year. But um, but I also colored some of the pages um, and and lettered some of them. Uh, so I'm I'm a little a little ahead on on that front too. Um, my goal was to color as I went because I liked breaking up the task. I would color I would color a scene at a time. Uh, in, in between pages, but I was I became unable to do that or I, I couldn't juggle that anymore. So I just focused on the drawing and that means I'm gonna have quite a bit of coloring to do uh, at the end. Um, I use Manga Studio uh, for for coloring and I'll show that later um, and for lettering. Uh, GIMP is like a free photo editor. I use that just to clean up the files, uh, resize, things like that. It's a little faster than for me than, than using Manga for that. Um, and I have a scanning bed that's big enough for my pages. The pages I use uh, I, are the Strathmore, Bristol. Um, I forget. It's the 300 series. So I think like 200 or 250 series is the kind that that has blue lines on it, uh, which like it's like guidelines that show you where the where you could draw. Uh, this doesn't have that, so I have to use a straight edge, like a in a triangle. I mean, I could use a T square, but I don't really, I don't do that um, to to mark uh, the the safe spaces in the. And all the panels, so that that's like a a little bit longer of a step than it used to be with the blue line, but the paper is a little bit a higher quality, so I I preferred to that, um, and I actually I didn't even follow those blue guides I I uh, changed my uh, borders a little bit anyways, so uh, it wasn't that much of a problem. Um, 
when I uh, when I started uh, Volume Two, <clears throat> uh, Fairy Folk Revival, I started this uh, Google document and to just put in ideas and notes. So I'm just like I'm like okay. Uh, at this point, the story, some of the characters and the and the lore is already established from the last issue. But there, it it was a it was a pretty small world in the first uh, volume. Uh, it all took place in London, and you don't really learn that much yet. Uh, so there was a there was a whole lot that wasn't even you know figured out yet. And so I was looking up islands for where this the initial scene would take place. Um, and I was, and I'm literally looking up real islands. Uh, now I'm I'm not concerned about being uh, his, like historically accurate or factual to the real world as far as you know the island it's on. But uh, when I'm trying to come up with my uh, the fantasy, the lore that I'm trying to put in the story, and even like even plot points and ideas for what's going to happen, I get inspired when I start looking into. Uh, like Leros, Greece was actually the island home of the Greek god Artemis. I didn't know that, but my character was the Greek god Artemis, basically. Like that's that's how she identifies. Um, and so when I saw that, I was like, "Oh, how cool is that?" So uh, I will. I'm gonna have her. You know, this uh, when Cat, the main character, uh, Katrin, uh, Catherine. Uh, uh, when she gets um, banished to an island at the end of volume uh, one, uh, and that's where this story picks up, I was like, "Well, what is this island?" You know, <laughs> uh, and and that so that was like, "Oh, that's really interesting." And um, uh, trying to figure out, like, okay, like what's the what's some possible feels for uh, it, the, if I showed like um, an island town uh, or city and learning about um, what different cultures were in those places. It just gave me ideas. And, and I ended up doing nothing with that because uh, I avoided having her go into the town. Originally, I was thinking of a scene taking place there. And I just, I just showed a little bay in the background um, that I can show you guys in a little bit. Uh, so some of it just goes nowhere. But um, it does like for me the story becomes more rich in my mind uh the world becomes more rich and then hopefully some of that gets translated onto the page uh and into the story but just a fraction of it um and that's sort of my approach uh i would rather be like over prepared uh and then and then write from that uh so so this is not like writing this is some a lot of this is copy and paste that out of Wikipedia or whatever. Um, sometimes I just see a, a nice image and I'm like, oh, maybe maybe this would be useful in the comics. I'm throwing that in there, links to things. And sometimes I never even go back and look at this stuff. Um, this is literally, this is almost literally the island that I drew. I think it's funny that they had these little churches, <laughs> little chapels on an island. Like they had to bring you know, God everywhere, I guess, so that they would have this small island that's uninhabitable, but they'd put this little like church building there. Uh, yeah, okay, so some some uh, clothing and like, I actually used, was referencing this for uh, some farmers visit, the, I mean some farmers, some fishermen visit, I need to take off my ear, I can't hear myself speak because it's not coming through my headphones and they're like sealing. I feel better if I take it off one ear, okay. And you can all hear me, right? Are we doing? Because I, it seems like people's mics are off, so I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, I can, I can hear you. Okay, so uh, the fishermen <clears throat> that come to the island, uh, I wanted them to represent. You know, I, I was uh, have some diversity in and their dress. Like each each of them is has a little bit different feel. Um, what to show the eclectic kind of nature of this part of the world. Um, so I was looking up different uh, cultures and people at the time. <clears throat> uh, yeah, just things I find interesting um, that I might be able to draw from later. And this is before I ever start drawing the comic, uh, and it's usually before I write it. 
Um, but sometimes I'll write like part of it, and then I, when I get to the next part, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna have to do a little more research. Uh, so it's a little back and forth. Uh, yeah, and uh, there's a lot of I had to, to look a little bit into. Okay, I've, I have these characters that are gonna be like folk folk music uh, historians, and um, that are gonna have some some mystical powers related to that. And uh, I actually was able to find like people in history that like fit that bill a little bit and it kind of mixed up their names a little bit and backstories and whatever, but I just kind of like used them for inspiration for the, the two characters that, um, that become like Cat's companions in this next story. And, uh, and I also was studying a little bit about uh, folklore history and stuff and folk i mean folk music at, at that time uh to get a feel for what uh how people felt about you know classical music versus folk music and and different things what was going on and and i don't i'm not worried about being again i don't i'm not worried about being historically accurate but um it's just helping me get a, a more rich you know, wealth of background that I can draw from when I'm coming up with what I want to do. Um, yeah, I was trying to. F there was there was going to be a sort of like a, ba a bad guy in this new comic that uh, is not like the main villain, but it's going to be a monster of sorts that they have to deal with. So I was trying to figure out, well, what do I want to do with that? And I I found a really good. Um, option for that and it's so funny how how things fit together because uh i already knew i wanted to have some sort of monster that's like a fairy folk creature and i wanted one of the folklore uh, folk music gologists uh the characters that i was going to make up i wanted one of them to like have background knowledge on this on this creature, creature. and then and literally uh I forget which one. One of these two women here actually was known for studying and writing the song The Long Lankin, like recording the, the, the song of The Long Lankin, which is like uh, a folk creature that would steal children and women at night or whatever. And, uh, and that fit perfectly, which is, that's just weird. Uh, and no one's ever going to notice this stuff, probably. <laughs> like, no one would ever know that, oh, he took like this this person's the first name from that woman and she happened to actually study that you know like no no one's going to know all that and i'm not worried about them knowing that uh so yeah you see here like i'm giving myself a note okay so i've got my bad guy and i've got the and she's investigating and where did she learn it from Where'd okay learn it from? and and this guy is actually considered uh to be like the grandfather of sherlock holmes and he's like a badass priest <laughs> i was like well, that's pretty awesome. Uh, he's well known. I think if like British people probably all know who this is. Uh, I I slightly changed his name because uh, again I don't want to I don't want to be beholden to history. I don't want to have to follow it. Uh, so I I would rather mix it up so that I have the liberty to create how I want. Um. Okay. I was trying to think of some. I needed to find some instruments that were more ancient. This is the church and the scene that I'll show you guys today. I was trying to research uh, what what small town were we going to go to, and I found a uh, Daresbury, England, uh, is actually I think it's the home of the guy that wrote uh, Alice in Wonderland, and it's got a cool little church in the town. I was like, well, that's that's kind of cool. Um, I forget what else about the town, but that seemed like a, a good fit for my small town. That uh, a lot of the, some of those takes place. place. Uh, yeah, you can. I don't, I'm going kind of quickly here, but these are things that are going to come up in the story that I need to know about. All right, so that's all the notes in there. Uh, and then this is what my script looks like. So I come in and I just start typing it out. Uh, and this is like, the, this is the original 
uh, this is the original rough draft, and then it's like the edited version. But I never make a final script. It's always a rough uh, document. Uh, document. Uh, once I letter the comic, um, l well, when I when I uh, thumbnail when I thumbnail uh, the pages, I might I'm looking at this script and I'm changing some of the dialogue. Uh, I might even change what happens uh like as far as like act step-by-step -step action of a scene uh, or uh, the gimmick of the scene i might change a few things just at that stage then when i draw the page i might uh i might realize another dialogue line i want to use instead and i'll change it there and then when i letter the page like which is basically the last step i'll change it again i'll change the dialogue again until it, it so it's always in play uh, and everything's playful until um, that, the final version. Um, and so scene one, and then I just, this is page one, and I e each of these uh, begin beginning here is uh, a panel. So a medium close-up, I just, I'm just abbreviating however I want, close-up shot, medium shot. Uh, I, I'm not beholden to these. Obviously, I'm, I'm, I continue to adjust things, but this is me uh, mentally picturing the page. Uh, I don't write the story separate from the mental picture. So I, I immediately am writing and picturing it mentally at the same time in this document. Uh, and I have found I'm pretty accurate here. Um, once I draw the page, it typically will fit uh, with how I mentally pictured it. Like by page 10, by I really am. Really really and uh, yeah, and then I'll, I'll indicate the new scene. This line here is indicating a page break. I just remind myself, okay, 10, 11 break. Um, it's just helping me remind myself when I'm mentally picturing what will you see on each uh, set of pages. And, and this can be done, obviously, any any sorts of ways, but uh, this is the way that I do my script. And it is, gosh, 53 pages, because it is a, it's, so it's only 53 pages long, and it represents, um, oh gosh, like 240 pages of comic. So that, like 53 pages sounds long, but that doesn't sound very long for 240 pages of comic. I'm surprised I squeezed it into 53 pages. But when a page takes up like that much room, uh, you can see why it would happen that way. Um, when I wrote this script, I uh, it, this isn't I, this probably isn't exactly the original version. I, it's just the only document I keep. So like there, I would rewrite parts and delete parts and and and. But it's I don't have an earlier version because I, I would just write over it. Um, but even from here, I have cha I have had new ideas while I'm drawing the comic. I get inspired with new ideas of things to do, and I allow myself to change things even after like I've already started drawing. Like it wasn't until I got closer to the scene where some new characters were going to be introduced that I decided not to include them. One of them I deleted from the story entirely. And then another one um, I decided would be revealed later and play a slightly different role. Um, and by doing it that way, like I'm, I'm aware, I feel the, like I feel concern. Like when, when, when everything's a rough draft and everything's done roughly and when my pencils look rough before I put the inks down, like I feel anxiety about all of that, uh, but I'm trying to find this balancing act because if I, um, if I try to control it too much, the story and everything, to try to get it perfect before I put it down, I end up, I end up not making the best thing I could. Uh, to, I'm being too controlled, and then if I'm if I'm too loose, then I I'm good. I I know that the end result, uh, you know, for instance, when I deleted this character and changed one, like that seems like a rookie mistake. It seems like uh, you should have that figured out before you're drawing it, and the end result would be uh, somewhat improvised, and surely a better comic could have been made if I had been more thorough in my. Uh, 
preparations. And there, there's probably some truth to that, but at the same time, the 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 flow of creativity, the the um the sense of spontaneity and playfulness, I want that to come across in the in the final product. I'm not worried about it being perfect in in some ways. Uh, and I enjoy like movies and you know, things that just feel more playful, like uh, Twin Peaks, David Lynch, very playful. Um, I, I enjoy uh, comics and, and movies that that feel that way. Uh, so, so I, I guess I'm shooting for that to some degree, and I feel like, uh, again, there's the balance. I don't want to, I don't want to improvise too much, um, and I've actually become looser and looser lately. Uh, and I'll show you that now that we're, I'm probably ready to get into my drawing. Uh, but before I do, any questions? Uh, do you want me to clarify anything? about the script or preparations for the book? I don't really have a question, but I will say I like the way you do your script. I've never seen it, seen one executed like that. Oh know? yeah. And I, I like that you do keep it loose and you can change whatever you want, whenever you want. And you're very sure of what you want it to be when you're done with the page. So I, it's really, I have to like give myself strict rules, even when I write my own stuff, you know, because I'm so fragile about the story structure. But I, I think that's really neat though. I just wanted to compliment you on that. No, oh, nice. Thanks. Yeah, it's really cool. Awesome. Um, there, there's something I was going to show you. Oh, uh, I guess, you know, talking about preparations, um, before I show you the page, I should probably, uh, I do, I do some, you guys have even seen it, uh, when I've been in the coffee shop before, when we got to meet in person and I would, um, I would draw some things that were going to end up in my comic. Um, I don't have, I don't know if I have that. I don't know that I have that sketchbook with me right now. I don't think I do. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. I, so I don't have that one with me. So I do have a sketchbook um, that I, th this sketchbook is one that I only draw. Um, like I don't want it to be for the, for a comic or for any project. It's just for drawing. Uh, and then I have ske a sketchbook where I'm doing my thumbnails and sometimes uh, drawing things to figure out what they're going to look like in the comic. Pretty much the only time I did that was in this page I was working on today and then the pages leading up to it. I had to draw uh, a large wild boar a while, uh, and I had never drawn a pig before. <laughs> I was like, they're, they're kind of odd. They're, their skull shape and nose and everything's kind of strange so, uh, and body shape even. So I wanted to figure that out and I didn't take very long, but I, I Googled some images and uh, drew just some sketches real quick so that I had an idea of how the body's stru uh, structured and the face. And it, well, I didn't have it, I didn't have it perfectly figured out yet, but I felt like I had enough knowledge to start drawing the pages. Um, so that's an example of, of that kind of preparation. And uh, the page that I'll, that I, recorded myself drawing so I can sh talk about it with you guys while I, while we look at me doing it. Um, it is almost unintelligible. This, uh, this thumbnail is so rough. Uh, matter of fact, I th I'll show you one that's a little more clear, I think, <clears throat> first. Okay. So in this page, uh, it's I'm trying to roughly figure out um, what this view is going to look like. The, the characters are looking off down a road and there's a little farm at the end. And uh, let me see. And then there's a slightly closer up view and there's like a rumbling a sound effect happening. So that's drawing their attention in. And then uh, we see like the grass parting as the rumbling is even closer to the rumbling. And then uh, the pig bursts forth uh, to 
here where we saw the farmer and destroys the wagon and runs runs towards the camera basically towards the uh people viewing so um that page i so i i just thumbnailed that out and you know what uh i'm curious if it's even in my script so i'm going to scroll down here i wonder if this how it's worded in here uh, you know, and I, I I changed some of this scene, so I'm not sure. Uh, I did make a few changes also because uh, I was having trouble. I did actually get um, behind on page count, and I wanted to make this fit in like 64 pages of of drawing uh, maximum, and so that also limited me here on how many things were going to happen in this final action scene. Uh, Here we go, uh, page 51, rum, rum, rum. They all turn to see what is across from the church. Uh, trees, bushes, field, dust blowing up, and a rumbling sound. This was like months and months before uh, I actually drew the page. Uh, some farmers uh, on a reaper machine or something like that in a field. Uh, that's a long shot, medium long shot. They get knocked off, the explosion, uh, dust and wood, corn field is being shredded in a line directly headed for the church. So that was actually 51 uh, in my script. It's, it's 54. So I have gotten off. Um, but uh, I'm not, like, I'm not, if I get off, it's typically, like, when I design a page, I obviously want the panel one to the last panel to be a certain sequence, a certain story. So you'll notice, like, uh, obviously, this is the, the, my page 54 is this page 51. Uh, it's not like I'm going to, like, be having the first panel of page 51 is on the last page before that. Like, I'm not going to get off in that manner. I'm going to be off in page count, but not, like, which panel would come first on a page, unless I have a better idea of how to sequence the panels. Um, so I probably took something that I was trying, like sometimes I have taken something that I was trying to squeeze into one page and I was like, I'm just going to turn that into two pages to take more time on the sequence. And that's, that, that's probably why I'm behind on page count. Um, and then, so I showed you the thumbnail and the page. Here's the final page. Uh, you know what? I have a digital copy. That's going to be easier to show you. Uh, da, 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 da. Here we go. I probably scanned it in by now. Uh, page 54. Okay. Can you guys see that? Oops. There we go. Uh, zoom in a little bit. Okay, so uh, I I couldn't hear you guys. Can you see it, see this? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, that that first scene, drum, 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 the sound effect uh of something uh in the distance, and then we get a closer view of right here. And same, I'm keeping the same camera angle. It's almost like it's zooming in or jumping to a closer view. I don't want to confuse the reader by changing camera angles at this point. Uh, and one of the things that helps with uh, the feeling of zooming in is going from no panel border on the top panel. It's, it's, it's a larger panel, basically. And then you'll see that the second panel is boxed and it's smaller than the first one. So you get that feeling of moving in um, just from the, the, the size of the panels in comparison. And uh, I don't often play with panel size. I like to keep a pretty structured uh, panel design. But in the third panel, I, this, is, this is one of the few times I've done this, uh, I decided to go even smaller in size than a standard panel to continue that feeling of cutting in closer. So panel one was full bleed, and then this is a standard panel width. And then this one is even tighter. And this, uh, now when color is gonna help, but this is the boar's back, uh, and then wheat being kind of pushed aside. 
Uh, so a closer view of that. And then we go to full bleed again. So you get a more, uh, you also get a larger effect at this point because you've cropped in tightly and then go to maximum width back out. And uh, boom, the pig breaks the wagon. It would have been nice to show the reaction of the farmer, but um, I liked the balance of keeping them, him and the wagon further away from each other. Uh, so I, I kind of liked this balance of an image. And then that means there's no way to show him and also keep the focus on this action um, and keep the camera angle at the same angle that I want to keep it statically through each panel. So, uh, you know, had I planned better, there's, there probably would have been a better way to do this that where I could have shown the farmer, I could have repositioned these pieces and, and had him uh, in view. But, um, but I'm okay with that. Like, maybe this is better. I don't know. But maybe this turned out better because uh, if, if I were to show the farmer's reaction, it would kind of downplay this explosion of energy of, of this image. Like, to, it would draw your eye over to the farmer and his reaction which would might just be a distraction honestly so i'm pretty happy with how it turned out lately i have gotten looser in my line work um and so there's quite a bit of uh scribbliness to <laughs> to how this is done uh, you can especially tell in this panel uh with where the wheat is parting uh I'm, I'm i didn't even i'm not drawing all of the wheat there's just scribbles there and every now and then something that looks a little more like a head of wheat and uh with color, I'm just hoping that's clear <clears throat> enough. I'm not worried about um, worried about it. I've also started using my brush uh, sometimes on the page, which is like that. That's a rule I've kind of given myself: is that I only use the the pen to make lines, and then the brush just fills in space. But lately, I have allowed the brush to go outside the lines, so to speak. Um, like here where I just wanted to create um, some shadow and a sense of uh, weight on the page rather than really worrying about like shadow. It's more about weight. And that's why I threw some brush lines into the wheat to uh, that, that are a little more less structured than a, than a pen line would be than I would normally do. Um, all right. So, it, I guess I should leave that open. Anyone, anyone want to comment on that or have any questions about that? Dude, I like how it's very cinematic. I, I, I never would have thought of like the big open panel, like no, non-box panel like that, and then getting that sense of claustrophobia. It's like a fuse. And then it's oh, like yeah. A, because this panel is your biggest panel and it's perfect right. like a fuse it's a, it's a firecracker it's like triangle shape to our big explosion little to big right. and you can still read that I knew what that was when I saw it I was like oh it's the board just running through everything's readable on here man this is this is really really cool and that, that definitely uh, gives me more knowledge to try something like that and yeah. inspire me to do structure like that. Cool. And the fact that you use a brush, you're pretty brave. <laughs> okay. yeah, just throw it in there. Yeah. Well, and uh, there are some pieces where I've, I do use a whiteout pen, like a, an o opaque uh, white paint pen. Uh, and so, like, there, there are <clears throat> places on this page that I cleaned up a little bit. Like, uh, I decided, uh, I decided I wanted, um, I wanted to show the depth of this wall. So this is probably wide out. This, um, this inner edge to to this wall. I can tell. Yeah, and I'm not worried about it being like obvious that it was whited out. <laughs> yeah. I I used to I used to hate that, but I don't mind anymore. Yeah. And uh, and and that's uh, that's part of my choice lately to get looser. Um, and this is a good example of it. Uh, and these pages aren't touched up yet. Like I'll I'll go in and um, clean them up a little bit, uh, so you wouldn't see like 
on the on the final page, you're not going to see this smudge right along right. here. Uh, this discoloration here, where some whiteout was used, um, but like, like this lettering is like sketchy. But when I keep the lettering more sketchy, it reads more naturally. If the drawing, like I can have the drawing be a little sketchy, the lettering be sketchy, like the wheels on this wagon up here. Uh, um, like you can see how lines are overlapping some. It's not very clear. Right. Um, and, but, but as long as the whole page and like this roof and like the, the, the gesture of shingles on this roof, yeah. like if I was really rigid in rendering the shingles, I would also have to be rigid in rendering the wagon wheel and like, and the lettering. Um, but if everything has a similar feel of the level of rendering and the level of spe specificity, you know, uh, then, then it reads okay. It feels more natural. As as a, nothing stands out as wrong. Is that that's my idea? Uh, obviously, I could improve, but that's <laughs> that's my idea of why I'm keeping things looser um, and trying to find that right feel. Do you do you feel like you have a pretty decent balance between your digital and your traditional work? Uh, well, I, I never ink digitally. I never do. I just color digital. Yeah, but even if that is your balance with your traditional work, do you feel like you have a balance with your process? Like, you're just as comfortable doing your digital coloring as you are your pieces, and you do other pieces yeah. like that as well, correct? Like, outside of your comic, do you work like that? Um, well, lately, I've only... Uh, I just do Copics when I... I don't know if you guys saw the swamp thing I did recently. I want to say yes. For uh, yeah, for Josh. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure where that's at. Is it on your Instagram? It is. Yeah, that's all Copic. Um, mo like all all the commissions I've done are Copic more coloring. Um, but coloring digitally came first, and then I started doing Copics maybe a year ago was the first time I started doing Copics. Coloring digitally uh, prepared me. Like it, I w that was not my strong suit. Uh, so doing that for quite a while on my comics uh, got me better at uh, color, like choosing colors and uh, rendering and, and so on. Um, the colors I do are, matter of fact here, uh, I, I do pretty flat colors and cell shading style. Yeah. So this is like page one of the comic. <clears throat> um, the the type of printing I'm doing, I probably need to have ink on every inch of the page, mostly. Like a, maybe a word balloon could be white, but it, due to the printing plan I have, that's why the gutters are all tan. And in, in a later scene, they're all going to be like a light blue or something. Like, I'll, I'll go ahead and choose a color that fits that scene. That's cool. Uh, but it'll also help, like, the word balloons pop as white. Uh, but <coughs> for, the, for the printing, I don't know if you guys are interested, but uh, I'm doing an uncoated paper. And the ink will provide some uh, durability and um, grip. Uh, so it, it, if ink is on the, the corners of the page, people can turn the pages much more easily. Nice. It, and I just found that out by trial and error. Like uh, I printed uh, with white borders uh, my last comic, and I noticed that they were hard to turn, uh, but that anywhere there was ink, there was a nice sheen, durability, and grip to the page, even though it was uncoated paper. Uh, so so I just planned on that for this issue. Um. Yeah, this you know this page is kind of <laughs> that's that reminds me of the one I just showed you guys.
Did we just lose Isaac? <laughs> is he frozen? I, I think, Are you frozen? I think we lost him. Yeah, at first I thought he was like looking at something. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> uh oh. on this computer like couldn't connect but uh it's on in the living room it's weird huh. um but I, I just disconnected and reconnected so uh i don't know where i got frozen honestly was it when i was talking you about were, color? you were showing the uh, color page uh and how you had to get a certain type of page because it was really glossy and like how it came out yeah. they were they're the the horses with the uh apparatuses on their faces right yeah. All right. Uh, I th so, and you heard about like um, the the uncoated paper. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So okay. After <laughs> after that, I just said a little bit about uh, the color choices, how it's challenging when you use more flat colors to uh, to show to imply things that. Are more that are only clear through more realistic rendering, right. um, and that I find myself gravitating towards uh, less realistic color choices as a way to imply the information that is, would be only seen through like full rendering, um, and but that also creates a more playful and colorful comic than originally I had in mind. Uh, I guess the last issue, the last volume i was doing more um it was I, I had a I had a darker theme in mind but it's becoming a more playful comic at this point and part of that's just uh my color choices are coming out that way but there's other reasons for that too and i'm, I'm happy with that that's fine uh do you guys want to see a little bit like i could talk about talk oh, talk while i am show the video of me drawing the page hey nora what's up <laughs> do you need a tissue okay <laughs> what do you need girl do you need a charger okay all right i'll see you later she's hanging out in the living room watching a show while i while i draw uh do this with you guys yeah do you guys have the time to look at the page i want to see it Okay. If anyone needs to go, that's all good. Because uh, and James, you're going to be able to record the whole thing, anyways. If anyone needs to cut out, right, right. I paused it during okay. when you were gone, so and I can cool. easily yeah. edit it as well. Um, okay. I'm going to go back and try to listen to this later and make sure that the audio didn't get screwed up uh, like the other one. Hopefully, the fix is me wearing the headset. Yeah. So because I think. It might it sounds good to me. Well, when I did my recording, it was recording not only the audio that Nate was talking, but the audio that was echoing out of my speakers. Yeah. So we got double audio on everything. It's really yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So hopefully that'll fix this. Nice. Uh, all right. So I'm going to, I'll go to present. Okay, I want to be able to. Sorry, I want to see you guys too. So if I can uh, try to push you over here. Ah, I just pulled it to the top of the screen. Don't do that. Okay, there we go. Uh, can I adjust this box? I don't know. There we go. All right, so. This is the recording. I, uh, I'm probably putting this on my Patreon, so I had a little intro uh, to indicate what I'm doing. This is my dining table in the background. <laughs> um, and uh, I've got my pins and stuff sitting here. I think I... Hey, hey. Can you hear it? Can no, you hear, I the... can't hear it. You can't hear the video? Uh-uh. Okay. 
Okay, so I'll just tell you. I have I have a the thumbnails book is right there. And I use those to draw the word balloons. All right, and I have all my pencils right there. And then all the pages that I've drawn of the comic are sitting to my right. So if I want to reference someone's face or what the building looks like or whatever, all the pages are right there next to me. Because I don't like to get my phone out. <laughs> I like to look at the physical thing. Um, so I think I can click 30 ahead. Okay, so I'm just putting my name at the top. So uh, I... To draw my boxes, I used to do it. I used to draw my panels in pencil first, and I have started just going straight to pen. Wow, um, it's faster. <laughs> and then uh, that means that there's no like uh, there's uh, there's lines going between the gutters. Like I'll just do a straight line down the side, but um, I uh, I can erase that in uh, in Manga Studio. Uh, so there's a little pause there in the video because I realized that my thumbnail was not uh, no, was no longer accurate enough to draw the page. Um, let's see. Well, crap. What page is this? I'm trying to find the thumbnail that corresponds to this. Yeah, so... Uh, well, you know what? I'm going to show you what leads up to this scene, I think, to give you some perspective here. So uh, I can't see it very well. Okay. So the, the pig has made it all the way up to our characters. Our main character's darting to the side there as the pig is not really charging for her, but past her to the church. And... Uh, I actually can't see it. Oh, I'm going backwards. Here we go. Uh, so the pig uh, is almost to the door of the church here. She starts to play her instrument, uh, which has magical powers. And she, you see the music coming out of her instrument towards the door. And, and then I, imply, I wanted to imply that it's locking the door. So I showed the musical notes going through the door handles. Uh, there's, there's cool, there's probably cooler, there's other ways to show that I could have done it, um, especially with more rendering and color and so on, but I just wanted to keep it more in the cartooning, uh, so I did it that way. And then, uh, and then we've got the pig just before impact, angry, close up, and then he slams into the wall, uh, of the door, and it's just solid thanks to the magic. So he's uh, stopped. I think that's... Oh, and I was 54. That's actually page 57. I think I said 54 before. Oh, that maybe that's the one I showed you earlier. Okay, so when he slams into the wall, uh, that was the first panel. Well, that was going to be the first panel of this page but I was able to put it on the last page, so the page that I'm drawing here on this video. And then uh, I was going to show the tower. Uh, this is very rough sketches, but I was going to show the the tower. Um, when he hits the building, he shakes it, and it causes the bells in the tower to ring. And earlier I showed that the ringing of the bells hurt Cat's ears, the main character. And so I'm trying to build up some information here about what the pig's goal is. He hates these bells. And, and it interferes with cat's magic. Um, so I needed to show that, I needed to, for the story, I wanted the building to rattle and uh, cause the bells to ring more quietly. Um, so there's a ding dong here. Um, the next panel is literally, you can't even tell, but I, I knew what that was at the time, but it's just scribbles. And uh, she's saying, ah, so it's hurting her. But then, like, I changed my panel order. So, like, it's I, I put numbers here, one, two, three. And then I came down here, four, five, six, and then seven, eight. Like, I threw those in the middle. Uh, so I didn't bother redrawing the thumbnail. I just, you know, indicated what my thoughts were. Um, so, uh, let me see. Two, three. So we see that a cat's annoyed by the bell and that the pig is 
shook by the bell. And then we see um, the pig. Originally, I was going to show the the other the folk musicologist characters. I was going to show them reacting like, ah, the pig's bothered by the bell. Let's go ring it some more, which is just going to cause problems for Cat. Uh, so their reaction and uh, intention to go ring the bell. So the girl saying it's the bell and her and the guy talking about how they're going to go up the tower. Um, and then I was going to show the pig uh, kind of coming to his senses and being angry at Cat, realizing she had uh, locked the door. So just a close up of the pig. Uh, and then him charging, uh, a nice kind of medium long shot of him charging uh, at Cat because he realizes she blocked him from getting in the door. And so now he is aiming for her instead of the door, uh, raising the sort of stakes. So that was my thumbnail. And then I, when I started to draw the panels, I realized uh, I didn't know uh, that, that, I, that I had to change the panels. Like I had to change the plan because uh, one of the panels was on the last page. So uh, I just had to pause the video and think for like a, couple, a minute or two and, and just picture the page and, and choose what I was going to do. So back to the video, uh, I had I had figured out what I was going to do, um, and I'm just measuring off the top of the page there. I measured off of the the left edge of the paper, uh, one inch, and then I measure another uh, ten, and put another little black dot there, and I do it at the same thing at the bottom. So my straight edge, my T square, like what I know is what I know is true is that left edge of the paper because the paper's not always cut straight, uh, perfectly straight. So I can't measure off of each side and, and have a true box. So I, I just measure off the left side and then everything's measured from there. Uh, and then I make the line. And then I use a triangle to go horizontally so that off of that left edge. So that's, that's, my, that's my straight edge. That's how I know everything's square. Because I had a problem with that before where the paper wasn't cut perfectly square and it was throwing off my panels. I was like, oh, I need to actually do this right. I'm eyeballing the, the width of the gutters. Um, I, I do taller vertical gutters and narrower horizontal gutters. I had seen people use different gutter sizes in different comics I've read. And I noticed that horizontally it was easy to tell when you were going to a new panel. So you didn't need a very big gutter. But I liked the feel of a larger gutter uh, going down the page, having these, well, these horizontal gutters that are when you're breaking from one section to the next. I liked that being a larger gutter because um, it made it clear. Like, it's almost like the top third of the page is a page. And then, and then the middle and the last piece. Um, so it, that's just my preference. So my vertical gutters are thinner, and then my horizontal are wider, typically. I think you're gonna like. This so one. so uh, this page starts off with the bell, the bells ringing, the tower being rung, and so I did a tall vertical panel because I, I was uh, going to show the, now. I was going to move the camera from over by the pig to like up the tower. It's because uh, he talks about using cinematography. I tried not, I try to avoid, you know, using a tall panel because I have a tall object and like a big panel because I have a big object. That That's not good. <laughs> that's not good storytelling. That shouldn't be what, what chooses your uh, panel shape. But because the camera was moving from the bore, uh, down at ground level and up to the top of the tower. And I wanted to give the impression of this ringing going up the tower, and I wanted to do it in one panel in a small amount of space. Uh, it, I felt like it was right to go uh, with this vertical, this taller vertical panel. And that's it. So uh, like the any of these black lines that are where they shouldn't be, I'm going to erase that digitally. And now I got my pencil. Oh, I, I shouldn't have skipped that, maybe. This is the good part. <laughs> All right. Uh, so um, I just have a mental picture of what I'm going to do with this tower with a little bit of perspective, not drastic. But I used to use a blue pencil, um, and I find that I don't need to do it anymore for some reason. 
Um, and this is pr it's pretty loose. And uh, I, I have a good idea of the shape of this tower already because it's on previous pages. So I'm looking on my right, I'm looking at this church on a previous page I drew to get an idea of, of that. And uh, I, I typically don't like using motion lines like this, but in this case, I felt like to show that he shook the whole tower, I'm gonna like draw this irradiating line coming off of the, of the tower. Uh, leading, you know, up to the bell. The perspective, so I, I did not actually use a, like a, what do you call it, like a perspective point on the horizon line. Like, I didn't actually use a point. I'm just eyeballing that. And, um, I've been finding it fascinating lately uh, how color, uh, how how shadow works, because um, I'm running into some problems in. Uh, I'm in a I'm in a town for this these scenes. I'm in a town with a lot of uh, buildings, and so I like to do really harsh shadows. But when you have a scene where everything is in shadow. If it's already in, this this side of the building is technically in shadow already. So how do you do indicate shadows? You can't show uh, like it's not like the sunlight is hitting from the top left in front of this build building, but my the way I'm gonna draw these shadows probably would make you think that the sh the sun's behind it. But I can't just put it all in shadow. That would I don't I don't I wouldn't like the look of that. It would. Um, and so it's interesting to think, okay, so the light's bouncing off of the ground, the other buildings, you have secondary light sources. And if you look at buildings that are in shadow, uh, there's shadows on them. There's other shadows, not just the shadow, the, the, direct, the original shadow the, from the sun. There's the shadows from uh, in other crevices where the light's bouncing off of other objects. So um, that's been kind of fun to play with and, and challenging. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, put my musical notes in. So let me skip, let me go back. So um, uh, this, this panel here I, is the pigs, a close-up of the pig. Um, I, didn't, I didn't thumbnail this, so this is totally different than the thumbnail. Uh, and, and I just had a visual picture. I want, I want the pig in the top panel and uh, first attempt... And it's not necess it's not really ideal. There's things I don't like about how I did it, but um, it, I, I felt it it fit and it had the it felt it had that nice loose improv feel that I kind of like. So I, I just went with it. But sometimes I'll be wrong and I'll have to erase it. I'll decide it's not what I wanted to do and I'll erase um, the drawing. But this time I didn't. I went with it. I'm sort of trying to flesh out the shape here after I got the edge with the shadows here. But it's pretty loose. And uh, along here is the music uh, notes that from the bell are coming across and to imply that it is striking his body and that he's having a hard reaction to it. Because I did such a close-up, it's really hard to show and imply that the pig is being troubled by the sound. Uh, so not not as clear as it could have been that the sound is bothering him but in the next panel uh, that he's in i think it's a little more clear because you can see his whole body um and it and you see that cat's bothered by it and i think it kind of is clear so i have his reaction then i wanted to have cat's reaction to the to the pain of the bell sound um but i didn't want to do just i didn't want to go from a close-up of the pig to a close-up of her because um, on this page, I've yet to establish the environment. Uh, there's no establishing shots yet. So even though this is a really small panel, I thought, okay, I'm going to pull the camera back over the shoulder of Cat so that you can see the pig and see her. Because I went from the tower back to the pig. Now I'm going from the pig to Cat, but I'm going to keep the pig, pig in the pan panel as my reference point. 
so people know where they're at in space. So um, there's cat here facing the church. These lines I'm putting up are the, the church's uh, structure. Windows, door. There is a little, uh, there's a little fence, uh, like stone fence with iron uh, poles on the top of it that goes around this church. And so that's what that horizontal edge is that kind of between her and the church. And there, there's no thumbnail of this. I'm making it up on the page. And I needed the musical notes to go through this panel as well from the bell. So that's what that curve is. Fleshing out the character more. I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit. Throwing in the fence. What weight lead are you using? <clears throat> uh, what is that? I forget. It's an H. Nice. Okay. Uh, this paper is not very toothy, so uh, it comes out like a little more harder than an H, probably. Like in my sketchbook, uh, it's rougher paper, and uh, it'll it'll look softer than than that. Figuring out the church, the doors on the church. All right, so now I'm erasing. <laughs> Uh, I just drew the doors of the church uh, to make sure like that they're in the right spot. And I'm like, oh, i got to put the pig in front of it. I'm going to have to just erase some of that. I wasn't, I wasn't sure about the shapes I threw on her body, so obviously I was touching that up again. But uh, there's also, of course, there's this balance because I do reach the point of I can't add more pencil without erasing. Like, you, or you you just can't add more pencil because uh, once you ink over it and try to, because I erase my pencil through the ink, but it'll like, not only that, if there's too much pencil on the page, my inks don't look as good because I can't see, the, I can't see like an empty page. I can't see it. My, I feel like I'm tracing with my ink pen or something instead of like really able to see what I'm putting down. So um, sometimes I'll reach a point where I'm like, okay, I'm not sure of that shape yet, but I need to stop drawing and just go to the inks. So I'm getting ready to do the pig. There we go. I think I, I think I had just pulled out my reference drawings of pigs to remind myself of the body shape. There we go. All right, I guess I'm, oh, yeah, putting in some music notes there. Okay, putting in some sound effects that I had missed. On to the next panel. Uh, this time, it's just a closer up view of the last panel. Um, showing that the, uh, I needed to show that the, the boar, like, Cat's telling the boar to stop, and the the boar is uh, directing its anger attention at her, because in the next, uh, after these next two panels, those the next two blank panels there are going to be the other two characters discussing, oh, we need to go up the tower and ring the bell because that bothered the boar. Um, but the last panel goes back to the boar and cat, and the boar is charging at her. Um, so I wanted to establish that the boar is about to charge at her in this panel, cut away, and then go back. Um, so, oh, and the, the musical notes that are running through that page are, it's a thinner line. So I'm implying like the sound is dying down, they're less bothered by it, they're able to go back to what they were doing. And I can use color to do that too. I'll probably have a brighter, more rich color for like the the sound at first, and then later dull it or uh, dim it down. So, yep. Oh, maybe maybe I shouldn't skip all that. I was figuring out her her in this corner. It's another same same shot basically, and. Uh, Building her head. Let's 
side side shot of her head. And uh, the pig. Okay, so yeah, you see, you see where I'm making these triangles with my pencil. I'm trying to figure out the perspective. I'm like, okay, she's looking at the pig. Where is the ground? Like, how high? If I put the ground, and I haven't drawn the background yet because if I drew that first, then like I might not get the pig in the shot the way I want. I need the pig and her in the shot the way I want, and then I can build the background around that. So I'm looking at it. I'm like, okay, the pig's here. So that means my horizon line is here. You know, so my back, you know, that, that establishes where this church is going to be in the background. Uh, and, it, and it's a kind of high horizon line because I need to see the whole more of the pig. I don't want it to fall off the panel. It's a, it's, there's not much space there for it. Um, so, and look, I'm even going down onto the other panels and I'm showing, okay, her legs go all the way down here. And then I've got this this uh, distance between her and the pig and so on. And I'm not, I'm not actually measuring or worrying. I'm just kind of eyeballing it. I uh, honestly, I think that she's technically, uh, she's probably like too far away from this pig. Like <laughs> her distance has changed a few times from the pig. Like, but it, I, I feel like it's not a big deal to me. So it's not a drastic uh, inaccuracy. And went and I went ahead and uh, put in the, uh, the the bit of the fence here. Um, it gives a little. It just gives one more reference point to the viewer reader. Gives them another reference point of like the space because they they've already seen the fence multiple times and they'll see that there and it just helps uh, establish that with just a small a bit of information. Trying to figure out. Yeah, I'm, I'm changing my uh, vanishing point because I realized that uh, where I had positioned to the church and the vanishing point, I wasn't going to be able to show the fence on the right side. It was going to be too close to the edge of the panel, so I have to shift it a bit so that I can have a little bit of fence on the other side, which would make it look more balanced and clear what it is. So that everything's. I'm just adjusting everything back to that new point. Yeah, moving the church down some. So now the church is a little closer to the camera. Okay, I was going to say it was pretty far away, but it is closer now. Which means the roof is going to show. So I'm putting that in. There's the church. And again, erasing the spot where I'm putting that. So I, I, I figured out what the bore, I didn't draw the bore entirely first. Okay, so I guess I should clarify that. Uh, I mentioned earlier, I, I like to draw the characters first and then the background. Um, I guess that isn't exactly true, but I am sketching out the character. Uh, the I sketched out the bore and, and just got a feel for where he was, where he was gonna be and how big he was gonna be and so on. Then I drew the background, but I needed to actually render the bore last so that it, I can make sure it looks like he's standing on the ground. I want him to be in that space. Uh, and so if you render him fully first, it can be difficult to, uh, to, to make him look actually in the space. And uh, running, I also have a word balloon uh, and a large sound effect I'm gonna squeeze into this page. So I'm having a problem at this point. Um, the way I've chosen my vanishing point, horizon line and everything, uh, I'm very limited on how much of the pig I can show. Uh, I don't want an awkward cropping off point on his body, um, like not at a joint or anything. But uh, and I want, but I want most of his body showing so that it's so that he's in the shot, like, uh, and that there's a better balance to the shot. But if I if it's just a challenge also because I wanted a larger sound effect and word balloon in there, and then the music notes going along. Um, so I was playing with that a little bit, like how much can I, how far up can I raise his body, or what changes can I make to show more before I get to the edge of this panel and make it look balanced with the rest. And there I'm kind of thinking about the sound effect. 
at first I was going to do two words of grunting, but uh, I wanted a larger effect, so I'll end up changing that to one big uh, sound effect. And uh, I'm not—I don't worry about my lettering being very accurate, so let's pencil that out there. All right, I don't want to bore you guys too much. I'll skip ahead a little bit. Okay. Do you when, do you think uh, the zoo trip helped you out a lot with this, like with the boars and stuff? Uh, no. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't. I guess did I draw the boar when we were there? That boar was different. Um, you know, I, it probably did actually. I drew a lot of animals that day. Uh, and I don't draw animals very often, so I bet it did. But I do think that any time I've sketched and drawn it, it's all added up to yeah. being able to – it all adds up. So, yeah, it did help. I just can't think of specifically how that, that specific uh, drawing day helped. But it all adds up to making it easier to um, draw things other than humans. I also like that you pay attention to the perspective – like when it comes to your character's space in the like you're talking about the, you draw the line to where her feet would touch and it's like okay okay how she, how are we going to see that in the panel even i've done that yeah it's not in the panel but we need i need to have that accurate right right yeah. uh and i i've actually fallen into that trap before um so i had to like really watch that when i draw that shit. <laughs> yeah because it looks neat in a panel, but then you get down to it, you're like, wait a minute, that doesn't look right for a second. Yeah, so, yeah. So that's a good thing to do. This, uh, this pen I use, Le Pen, L-E-P-E-N. I think it's on, like, Jet Pens is where I order them. Le Pen. Jet Pens? Yeah, it's Le Pen. Yeah, that's the, that's the sort of, like, pigment pen I use instead of um, instead of a uh, micron. I used to use microns, but oh. I actually like the flow of this one better, the way it feels on the paper. Um, and it is like a dollar, dollar fifty each. It's like way cheaper. Oh, than wow. And I tested it, like I compared it and it actually held up just as long. It lasted as long as the micron and nice. it's less than half the price. So I just went with that. Sorry that my head's blocking it. I don't have an appropriate uh, stand for this. I don't. I don't. I don't worry about recording very often, so I, I haven't, you know, had made a good setup for that. It's not the best angle for all of this. So, yeah, here I am, inking. The pencils are kind of loose. And... When it comes together, then once you do put that ink on there. Yeah. And then, like, uh, some of these really long lines, my cursor's following right now. Those long lines are uh, tricky because <laughs> I don't use a straight edge uh, with my line. I just draw it by hand. Yeah. And uh, it's fine when you're, like, when your background is more organic, but when you have uh, buildings and stuff. You want it to be kind of straight. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's weird. That's like, uh, I wonder if other artists experience it too, where like the skill of just handling a pin is almost like something you learn late Yeah. in art. Is like, yeah. how do you, can you draw a, a curve or a, a circle or a straight line that's not tiny? Yeah. And it's like underestimated how useful that is. That pin control uh, is something that's worth spending time getting good at. Yeah, it really is. I'm plying some shingles there on the roof. Uh -huh. And some stone. All 
right, so I'm starting with the, uh, the the music notes that are kind of in the background. I'm starting with that first because it overlaps the pig's body, and I wanted to know where it does before I tried to ink the pig. I don't have the microphone on. And uh, there we go. I'm going to skip a little bit on this part. So uh, I usually do uh, digital lettering, but for larger, um, for larger, uh, like yelling or something, I'm, I'm playing with handwriting it in, giving it uh, more character if it's someone yelling or it's almost a sound effect. So um, like in this case, I didn't even put her uh, ah scream. I didn't put that in a word balloon at all. It's like a sound effect on the page. Right. Um, but if I, you know, like in the next panel, like she's kind of yelling stop. So like on, on a whim, I just went ahead and wrote in the word stop. It's not even centered in the panel. It doesn't look great. Uh, when I look, but I just thought I'll put it there because I did. I I typically would digitally letter her saying stop in the next panel, um, but I thought, well, I'll just throw it in, and if I prefer it, I'll leave it. If not, I'll erase it and write it in digitally. So better to have it there than not, and I'll decide later. Okay. <laughs> Some flew in my face. <laughs> oh, dang. Uh, all right, I'll skip a little bit. Yeah, got the pig. The all right. So I forgot to put in the this the uh, music notes first this time. So now I'm putting it in, and I'm gonna have to use whiteout on on uh, some of the church. I should have put my hair up before I drew, did this too, because it's blocking my uh view. Uh, this video is like, I think it's like an hour and 14 minutes long, and that's in real time. It's uh, it's about half the page, but probably over half the page worth of work, because some panel, the, these first panels are harder than the next ones. More, more info in them, so. Uh, an hour and 14 minutes, half a page. Pencil ink. Sorry, I'm blocking the view. There we go. So I'm trying to get down to like two hours a page lately. So uh, one thing I did here is it looks like, oh, maybe I didn't. Sometimes I erase the pencils before I fill in the blacks so that I can see the contrast better from white to black. But I didn't do that this time. Not Not very much, it doesn't look like. Yeah, and you'll notice there, like, uh, right here, when I fill in that, I decided I wanted a thicker line there, so I just moved it down. It, the edge is, not, so the micron, the pin was not the edge on that line. I just used the brush to finish it. It has a slightly different quality when I do that, but uh, it, I found it's okay. And then I realized I wanted to put a shadow on that roof from the tower, and I didn't uh, do it with the pin. So I was just adding it in with the brush. And I screwed it up, so I'll, I'll white it out later uh, a little bit to, to fix it. And yeah, and I'm adding more there because I'm like, OK, I could use a little more weight at the bottom of this panel. So I'll just extend that shadow down more just to feel like I have the right balance. And I already knew when I drew it that uh, I'll just tell you about this part now. I already knew that uh, I, this shadow ended up following the line of the tower at first and that looks like a tangent 
like it looked it, it's confusing and uh so so i wanted so i adjusted this angle with the white out so that the shadow fell at not at the same angle as the tower going up uh, so i have a little white out in this section here later all right filled in the bore And at first, I uh, sometimes I leave a little white space to show like a fold in clothing, and I'm like, oh, I'll just leave that, and then I go back and erase it. I'll go and black it in. So like right here on the back of her jacket, I left a little line, and I might even fill it in later. Or or just uh, so I, there's a little play at this stage. And the pig. I kind of screwed the pig up. Um, like he was just getting too close to the the bottom of his body uh, of his torso was too close to the uh, the bottom of the panel still even though I tried to correct that I didn't like how his legs couldn't be seen because a lot of the communication of his uh, anger and body position was going to come from that um, I just it, I didn't like how the drawing turned out I'm just going to move on with my life uh, but I did a little wide out to um, to try to clean it up a little bit and make it livable for me, like something I can live with. But uh, I wasn't happy with, uh, I, di I, I didn't quite nail that when I got the, uh, the drawing wasn't quite fleshed out enough before I inked it. So then I went to the sh shading and, and I got confused and it's just turning out all black because I'm just screwing it up. But uh, that's what whiteout's for too, so. And someone's only going to look at this panel for like five seconds at the most. <laughs> All right, so now I'm erasing. I uh, I don't. I've I've kind of played with those other kinds of erasers that don't sh like shed like this, but I actually like having it. I like this one, and it does you know leave a mess. But I can't push too hard, or the ink will raise off the page a little bit. But um, cleaning up the pencil. Isaac, do you ever take your uh, kneaded eraser and roll it up? Like, uh, this, oh yeah, this one's not a kneaded eraser. Oh, I thought you were using a kneaded eraser. No, that yeah, I couldn't think of the word, but that is what I was trying to say. Is uh, I've tried the kneaded eraser before, and um, I I didn't have the best of luck with it. Uh, I like this one sheds everywhere. It's a hard eraser, but um, but I also feel like I, it's easier for me to control the um. The, like the texture of the eraser and for it not to smudge pencil for me. And uh, uh, there we go. Doing the wide out on that edge because I noticed it was kind of tang a tangent to the, to the tower. Seeing if there's anything I need to clean up but trying not to nitpick too much. Any any spot where the the ink went out of the panel border, I can fix digitally. But sometimes I like go ahead and hit it with some white out. Um, but but if it's falling out of the panel border, that's easy to fix digitally. And I'm fixing that bore, uh, defining his jawline and uh, chest a little bit more with some white out instead of it just looking like a black blob. Uh, I So I don't know if you noticed, I used to dip a brush in ink and, and use a real brush. I now use the brush pen because it's just faster. Um, and it, it doesn't have as nice of an edge, but uh, it works for me especially because a lot of my edges are pen anyways. So you're not gonna. It's not like I need to get a nice feathered edge to my brush lines. Um, 
and then I'll take my brush pen or a pen and clean up anything. Yeah, I realized I wanted to adjust the shadow on the pig's face, so I added a little piece there with my pen. And then I went back in and cleaned up where I had whited out on the pig. Double-checked some lines that might need that. Still hit the whiteout again. Just wasn't quite happy with the pig. Uh, I like to I like to clean the background away from letters. If there's an, a sound effect, I just kind of make the background disappear around it. So I was taking the white out along there. And that's a closer up view of it. That's the result of uh, the whiteout. I'm pointing on the right now uh, to the where I used whiteout. Uh, like right there, I forgot to put in the sound effects before I drew the background, so I had to white out a few lines there. I made a few changes to that pig's face with the brush yeah, and straighten that edge. I use the Molotow uh, acrylic pump marker. Uh, you can find that on Amazon or whatever, um, and you can, and it's refillable. You can find refillable white ink for it or uh, acrylic paint. And I forget what that pin is, but you can find it's the pocket like Pentel or uh, what is it Pentel pocket brush. And there's the pin. I use a zero point three pin for every line. But uh, it may not correspond exactly to a micron. Um, some, I, I noticed some pins have a slightly different thickness, it looks like. But for that one, I used the 0 0.3. I, when I first started, I think I used to use a 0 0.5. And I've been tempted to go back because it would force you to get more abstract and simple. Um, but this seems like the sweet spot for me for now, for sure. And yeah, so that's it. Um, so I didn't even get to finish the other half of that page. It's still sitting here to be done. But that, uh, that that's everything for today, I think, that I wanted to show you. I, I'd, I would, uh, it's been going on a while and um, the only thing left is probably like coloring and lettering, but there's not much to show you there. It's like every, everyone has, uh, I'm not an expert in that, and it's not my. Um, uh, it's not like a, a complicated process. I I do for coloring. I just pick flat colors mostly and do it all on one layer, and uh, that's that's about it with that. Yeah, well, how do you go about choosing those? Choosing colors. Yeah. Uh. Well. I don't know. I don't know for sure. Like, um, I knew, well, let's take it a minute. I knew I wanted uh, this scene to have like a, a more f fall and golden feel to it. So I just went with, um, I, st I probably started with the goldish yellow, like the yellow and oranges on the sky, on the, uh, on the suits, and then this uh, pinkish reddish background color and uh, the fall kind of orange color. I probably started with those background colors and then filled in from there using those gotcha. as my my guide uh, rather than developing like a palette. And I'll just play with the colors until I like them. Uh, what, how far did that go? Page 11. But I can, yeah, I'll open one. Yeah, here's the next scene. So the next scene is on this beach, and uh, it needed to be very blue, and uh, it's got. I didn't want it to. I didn't want to be very golden and and bright. Everything's kind of muted. It's not. You know, it's not like it doesn't look like a super bright day. It almost looks cloudy, but um, 
I liked the feel of it for some reason. And uh, it definitely, like the sand on the beach, I didn't want it to look too golden like the last scene. I wanted there to be a break from that to this. It's like a cool, warm color in a weird way, like the sand. Yeah, yeah. I think I I started with uh, the the sky and and water and sand, and once I had that, I just built the other colors in as accents almost with all the characters and stuff. Uh, there is like you know there is the red on the back of the boat. There's the red on the edges of the boat here. There's the red tie he's wearing, and the red uh, whatever uh, thing around his waist. So, like, uh, there was an intentional repetition of the red. Um, it, it, it didn't make it into this panel, though. Um, yeah, I try not to change. Like, his jacket here and here and here and here, it's all basically the same exact color. Uh, so I, I, I don't know exactly why I do that, but... Um, Maybe it has to do with that repetition of the, like the red repeating is a, is pretty much the same red. It's a little bit different in, in this last panel because it's uh, I didn't want to draw too much attention to it, but um, yeah, the consistency of a, just this, the same color for that object is kind of nice. But I don't always do that. Like if there's a more drastic change, like someone walks behind a building and now they're in shadow, I'm right. gonna I'm gonna sh I'm gonna reflect that in the color choices. Um, but but I, I, I yeah I do it if there's a more drastic reason to do it rather than uh, all the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. And I don't think I've colored past this scene. And so it goes, uh, heck, let's see what it looks like if I go up a little further. I don't recall if I did or not. It's been a while. Oh, I did. Okay. So she, I went really wild with this. Um, she has just walked into a cave underneath the island where these fairy folk live. And they live on this island that she's <clears throat> vanished on in this opening scene. And they do weird stuff. And they have this weird glowing... Uh, so actually, like the 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 oysters, the they pull out pearls from the oysters that glow with magical energy. So it's the idea that like they're involved in natural processes, but there's like magic to it that they use that we don't even understand or see, perhaps. Um, so I wanted this to look unreal, um, surreal. So when you go down into the cave. Uh, the only light source becomes like this very strange green glow and uh and i should you know all the colors try to reflect that it was a bit of a challenge honestly um partly due to the uh i didn't execute the the space the drawing of the space as well as i would have liked uh so it, it made it less clear um foreground background middle ground so on uh so i had to try to use color to create that separation more um and and it just it, i had to play with that because like not everything can't be the same kind of greenish color so um there's that too trying to play with this the what color are the rocks underneath the green like the green's hitting them but there's going to be an interplay of of the uh the qualities of those surfaces and so on um I wonder how far I went in that. Maybe I did finish 21. No, didn't do 21 yet. <laughs> that just had the blank canvas. Probably. Oh, okay. So now we're in the town. Uh, so we went from like the, the tan gutters to the blue gutters. And now we're in town. And it's it's kind of that same tan again. But because the t the town is so muted, mellow, uh, that tan has a different feel. Uh, if, I, I feel like it works with this. It feels like more. And maybe it, I may have shifted it a little more green-yellow. I can't recall. It looks a little more yellow to me than in the opening scene where it was the more golden scene. 
but that's kind of like there's there's kind of going to be a a baseline you know gutter color that's that i'm going to use is probably going to be this color um and then if it's a if the scene if it if it clashes with the scene or is confusing for the scene i'm going to switch to a, a new color that suits that scene so uh yeah her father and back in london going into his apartment yeah it's kind of interesting like in this last panel uh there is like there's a room there's like there's more visual visually there should be a floor down there like a, pieces of trim the wall like the back wall of the building um there's like there should be more here than what i drew and so that's always interesting when i get to the coloring phase of if i'm if i'm letting my line work fade away in the background in a sense like i'm sort of trying even with the even with the uh the stairs it there's like a double line uh, <clears throat> lines that are broken even they don't even complete uh and so when i'm letting my line work break away as things sort of fade out of uh, out of the edge of perception or whatever um or blur out of perception at the distance whatever you want to say uh then when i color i have to do the same thing uh i have to find that same sort of balance okay these colors are fading away into some tone that's like a baseline tone so i have the uh the dark i mean the light source is up here so it's darker downstairs uh, and further from the light so i threw in a darker purple there and uh and then drew the drew things out of it as they move like from this purple to the more middle mid tone here hey isaac um, you ever look at yeah um, the old Chuck Jones uh, animation backgrounds from like the 60s and 70s. No. Um, Chuck Jones was very, he did a lot of similar stuff with his backgrounds. And oh, okay. I was going to point it out. It's like you're giving us all the information that we need. The mind's filling in the rest. You know, we, yeah. we can see the city. We can build it up in our imaginations. But, you know, you yeah. got the more detail up front. And Chuck Jones did that in a lot of the Bugs Bunny and Roadrunner ca uh, cartoons. Oh, where, okay. uh, especially the one where he's uh, with the Witch Hazel. Um, Witch Hazel. Yeah. Okay. And so the backgrounds on that one is really lovely. Um, very abstract shapes for the for the far ground, but more detail for what we need. Like at one point, oh, yep. it's just abstract yep. squares and. A, uh, shapes of the stairwell that you just see up until you get to the part where he's actually up close then you see more detail it's yeah, pretty cool yeah that's cool yeah all right well um yeah so i've got the uh i have the color layer and for the inks i duplicated it to uh, to darken it because the original inks were just a little thin. Uh, I've already cleaned up the page if there's any little smudges. Um, I do increase contrast a little bit, but if you do too much of that, there's a compression and a loss of uh, some of the information and drawing quality. So I, I double it to darken it. I do have a template uh, that I've created just to... I have a, I have a template for uh my dimensions and stuff so when i draw when i bring in my art i line it up to the template and then start coloring uh and yeah i can usually use uh i just use the my mouse and i use a paint bucket tool and uh Gosh, it's been a while. I guess a line segment polyline tool to like get the uh, the these sort of like blocky shaped uh, edges to these different layers of light coming out of this source here. I didn't even bother coloring all these people dancing and singing or creatures. <laughs> uh, I just I thought they're they're so uh, they're so immersed in the glow of that light that I should just leave them. And they're they're kind of smaller on the page. 
I didn't even color in the musical notes a different color or anything. I just let that be kind of part of the background, part of the environment of music they're creating, and I didn't want to distract from this glow feeling. And since she's up on the ledge, I obviously like uh, these colors are much toned down, and I wanted to clarify this foreground from the background because she had like she had woken up. So there's her eyeball. <laughs> Like she opens her eye, which kind of glows, and then uh, steps out, and uh, we hear their hears their singing, and uh, and sits down to watch, but she doesn't join them. So it's kind of showing her some of her isolation and struggles being with these fairy folk. It's also like the one of the first times I, I, this comic has a lot of fairy folk stuff in it, so I wanted to show more of just a little bit of uh, how they live. Uh, and how they're not always monsters or whatever. or uh, And they're not always animals. They have like human faces sometimes and are intelligent and so on. Before we get into more stuff in the story, this volume. I remember when you did, uh, you showed us the sketches of those little fairy guys. You were Oh, yeah, yeah. At Big Mama's. Right, yeah. Yeah, there's some of them there. Let me see. Oh, oops. Maybe it's this page. I'm trying to find the fairy guys. More of them. Oh, yeah, there they are with their babies. <laughs> with their little uh, blue duck feet. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Some kids playing some sort of like street hockey stuff <laughs> with a glowing ball. So just giving a little back a little uh life to these this culture or whatever. Yeah. There's not much to show on that. Uh, I don't I really I'm not sure how I would describe in more detail the color choices I do. Uh But I'll, like I said earlier with that one the foreground and background like needing to like if one if one's warm, one's cool. Uh yeah. And that's it, guys. I don't know what else to tell you. Any anything you want me to go over, or any questions? Wait, so you you don't use a Wacom to do your colors, you use a mouse? Yep. God, that's amazing, dude. I mean I, I mostly use the, the paint bucket tool. That's insane, man. Oh, it, it's pretty easy with the mouse to just click <laughs> that spot. <laughs> it's like MS yeah. Paint style. Yeah, yeah dude. That's, that's yeah. paint at its finest. But you know, but if I had the uh if I if I was using a a Wacom or whatever pen tool or, um I I would be tempted to do a lot more detailed coloring. <laughs> like uh it's kind of been nice to limit myself there like um and then i can because i'm using a mouse i get those uh rigid edges yeah. like uh like on this light um i just i was that wasn't the one i was going to show you where was it anyways one back when the when they were all dancing around the light there's rigid edges to to these things like uh well kind of and I like to keep that that style, which like it feels natural with a mouse to just click a strange polygon, and it has a certain feel to it if you do it. And I don't know if I would still have that feel using a Wacom. Yeah. Um, let's see here. But uh, this the the uh, this process I have has changed quite a bit over time. Um, I I shared a video on my Patreon of me drawing like the last issue back in uh, November or something last year, and I was penciling out the panels ahead of time. I was doing it at my drawing table. I used blue pencil. Sometimes I would even hit it with a little gray pencil if the blue pencil wasn't clear enough yet. 
then I would go to inks. I was more careful with my inks. I was just dipping my brush. Uh, there was a lot more care given uh, in November. Um, and it took twice as long. And that was an improvement on my previous times. Right. I, I, I'd, gotten, I'd gone from like eight to six hours down to maybe four. And now I'm getting closer to two. Um, but and so that was an improvement on on my previous uh, methods and and even my uh, I didn't my colorings had gone a little different style a uh, different approach to completing those and uh, over time and other things like that uh, I wonder where's my old comics at in here somewhere. <laughs> Uh, no, is it in here? We got some. Uh... Yeah, third issue of Great Judge when I just started making oh, comics. Man. I used a brush for everything on this issue. I was experimenting with that. I have a boy and his dragon still too. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I think it's the first thing I ever had of yours. But, uh, yeah, I saw that uh, actually before we met, and yeah. I was like, "This is a really fucking cool comic book." Who is oh, this nice. guy? The uh, yeah on this on this comic, um, I even I you can tell there's color variation. I was using a watercolor brush. I think it was in Manga Studio. Uh, let's see here. How do I? Yeah, see there. There's a, there's there's some color variation from the watercolor brush. Uh, so giving it a totally different quality than than what I'm doing now. Yeah, very sat way too saturated, but it was at night and it's this fire and I was like, I'll just do all fire. But yeah, there was a lot a huge a whole lot of learning process back back then. Uh, gosh, the very first issue. The ver first comic I ever made. I, it, yeah, the, yeah, okay. So there was a first print the very first printing of the first issue. I was I didn't know what I was doing and uh did some things that this is not the final images cuz there's a wide edge to it so I don't know what's going on there Yeah so you can even, like I didn't you can still see like the Strathmore paper at the top and uh the lettering is not a good font and uh, the word balloons are kind of too simple and rigid for me for my tastes now it's too dark it printed way too dark sound effects i were all digitally done but not super well uh and i found it annoying to try to do uh These are out of order, but you get the idea. I think I cleaned it up. Brightened up the colors, made the borders white. Chain, uh, fixed the font and word balloons some. So I did, I did have to fix some things on this one, but no. Yeah, I think that's a new font, maybe. I don't know. Um... Issue one. Wait, no, that's not the one I want. Ah. I froze it up. Um, yeah, even issue one of Musical Mishaps, I've, I've come a long way in uh, changing. Not necessarily for, for the better, just for my tastes. So, anyways... That doesn't matter. I don't, I don't it, really keep, it, keep it showing it. Like 
found your your style though like you know you definitely tell it's like your earlier stuff but like now you have your perfect pipeline yeah you know yeah i think that's uh, awesome yeah it feels that way it feels like i'm really good yeah. honing in on the way i like to do it but i bet if you went back and drew that scene as you show with so the two people on the cliff now it would be way different it would accommodate how you work now compared to how you worked back then yeah i think so too it'd be pretty different if you ever had time you should try that exercise <laughs> yeah go back to an old page and yeah yeah i guess <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a lot of work <laughs> yeah oh man dude that was great man thank you thank you thank you guys for listening